Nerds, it's M from Sano Nerds, and this video is on Unit 24, Patient Safety and Bioeffects. Unit 24, Patient Safety and Bioeffects. When we talked about intensities in Unit 5, we discussed briefly the idea of bioeffects. In ultrasound, when we explore the safety of using high-frequency sound to image the body, we need to recognize that sound energy could have some lasting consequences, which are bioeffects. There are two mechanisms by which bioeffects occur, thermal and mechanical. In this unit, we'll take a look at how bioeffects are studied, what tools are used, and then break down the thermal and mechanical risks to the patient. The section of the SPI test that contains safety, quality assurance, and new technology is only about 10% of the test. That means that this very broad category will only be about 10 to 12 questions, and there is a lot of information that pertains to bioeffects of ultrasound. But to avoid information overload, we'll try to balance good to know things so you have a foundation and they have to know things for the test. Section 24.1 Studying Bioeffects. The goal of studying bioeffects in relation to ultrasound is to ensure the safety of the patient undergoing an ultrasound exam. Studies are performed to determine safe levels of ultrasound energy. The good news is, is that when ultrasound is used with intensities intended for diagnostic imaging, there are no known adverse effects noted. However, we know that when ultrasound levels exceed those in imaging, bioeffects do occur. In fact, we even use this to our advantage. We know that very intense ultrasound waves can heat the tissue and have a therapeutic effect. But again, this is not imaging intensity, and we want to make sure our patients are safe during their diagnostic imaging exams. Mechanistic studies use hypotheses to guess what the bioeffects are and then test the hypothesis, where empirical studies look for patients that have already underwent an ultrasound exam and their outcomes are reviewed. Another issue with studying bioeffects is how we can study them. In vivo, which means in a live specimen, human or other test animals, makes it really difficult to have a controlled environment and few people, especially obstetric patients, would consent to pushing the limits on safety. In vitro studies, or models that use computers to predict bioeffects, are used instead. The data produced by the in vitro studies allows us to better regulate diagnostic imaging equipment to ensure the safety of the exam. When preparing a study on ultrasound bioeffects, it is best if the study is prospective, meaning the study is designed to answer a question and then the participants are recruited and randomized, meaning that the participants are randomly sorted into an experimental group and a control group. This can be difficult though, as we mentioned with in vivo testing, there are a lot of outside factors that cannot be controlled and you need a very large number of participants to conduct a better study. In the United States, there are many groups and associations that have created guidelines around ultrasound safety, most notably the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, or AIUM, and the Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, play the largest roles in regulating ultrasound equipment. The AIUM is a key contributor to the science behind ultrasound bioeffects, and the FDA considers the science and makes recommendations put forth by the AIUM and then regulates the output power or the intensity that machines in the U.S. can create. The science tells us that the SPTA, which is the Spatial Peak Temporal Average Intensity, should be limited to no more than 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared in an unfocused ultrasound and 1,000 milliwatts per centimeter squared in focus ultrasound. The science also highlights that it's actually the exposure time or the exam duration that increases the risk of adverse effects for the patient the most. The AIUM's official statement of biological effects in vivo is linked in the workbook. In general, it acknowledges that there are bioeffects from ultrasound when pushed to certain limits in the laboratory setting, but that these effects have not been reproduced when a professional, trained in the use of ultrasound, performs an exam with the ALARA principle in mind. I do highly suggest that you follow the link in the workbook and check out the AIUM official statements. There are quite a few regarding the safety of ultrasound. So speaking of ALARA, ALARA stands for as low as reasonably achievable. So that means that as sonographers, we don't perform any ultrasounds that have not been ordered by a licensed provider. We choose the correct ultrasound settings to minimize patient exposure to ultrasound energy, and we do not prolong the use of ultrasound unnecessarily. As a sonographer, you should choose the correct presets for the exam that you're using. Think about doing an early OB ultrasound compared to an abdomen that needs a lot of penetration. 
You'll want to watch the thermal and mechanical indices and only use tools that are necessary for the exam. This is important because pulsed wave Doppler ultrasound actually uses a lot of power concentrated into one area and therefore creates very high intensities. This is because the blood cells are very weak reflectors and they need more energy to produce meaningful echoes. 2D Doppler requires much lower intensity waves. So soft tissue is very good at reflecting sound and does not need as strong of beams. And remember that M mode is just one line of 2D, and so a 2 is generally safe for first trimester ultrasounds. In addition to making sure to only use ultrasound as necessary, the sonographer should also make sure that the equipment is in proper working order. Refer back to Unit 22, Quality and Performance, for more guidelines on quality assurance. Now, the machine can be a source of electrical and mechanical hazards as well to the patient. In fact, a crack in the housing of the transducer or worn down coverings creates the greatest risk to patient safety. Electrical shock can occur if the transducer integrity is diminished. Section 24.2, Measuring Output. The United States sets standards for the power that the machine can put out during a diagnostic exam. The equipment needs to be tested to ensure that the output does not exceed the FDA limits. To do this, the sound energy produced by the machine is measured. There are multiple tools to do this with, such as the hydrophone, radiation force, acousto-optics, calorimeter, thermocouple, and liquid crystals. These tools can calculate the dose of ultrasound that a patient is getting. Dosimetry is the study of dosing, and it's typically used as the determination and measurement of the amount or dosage of radiation absorbed by a substance or living organism by means of a dosimeter. As a side note, dosimeters are typically used to monitor personnel working with radioactive materials or patients receiving radiotherapy. Dosimeters are not typically worn by sonographers, but researchers do continue to evaluate the long-term bioeffects of ultrasound on patients and operators. There are two types of hydrophones. The first one is the microprobe. This is a small needle which has a piece of PZT material at the end, and this is going to connect to an oscilloscope. The membrane version is a large PZT membrane with small metallic electrodes centered on both sides, also connected to an oscilloscope. In the image here, then, we can see the microprobe. Right at the very tip here will be the PZT material. This tip will be placed inside the ultrasound beam to gather information about it. In the membrane version, the entire membrane is placed at different levels within the beam, again, to receive information and display it on the oscilloscope. So when the probe is inserted into the beam path, the oscilloscope displays the information received by the PZT. So the hydrophone is actually able to detect quite a few things like amplitude, period, pulse durations, PRP, PRF, and the shape of the beam. Because of its size, the hydrophone can detect acoustic information at very specific locations and can be moved to measure different locations within a beam. The hydrophone can detect the pressure in the sound beam and calculate information about where it's located, like the near field, focus, or far field. The hydrophone is probably the most important tool for you to be familiar with as a sonographer, as it is the gold standard for measuring acoustics. We can also use equipment that measures the radiation force. In ultrasound, waves can exert a small but measurable force on the object that it strikes. And there are two methods to measure radiation force. The first one is float mode and balance mode. In this example, a ball is placed either in float mode or balance mode, and then ultrasound is applied to the ball. The machine can detect the very tiny movement of the ball to measure the power of the beam. This can also test very specific areas of a beam. Acousto optics also gives us information about the beam based on the interaction of sound and light. The beam will create a shadow called a Schlieren. This allows us to see the shape of the beam and again, look at specific parts. For example, we can see the near field here. We can see the focus here. We can tell that the shadow is very intense at the focus and kind of in that focal zone. And then we can see that it kind of dissipates into the far field. A calorimeter is used to measure the total power of the entire beam by observing absorption. It's going to measure the increase in heat as the sound beam travels through the absorbing material. A thermocouple is a tiny electric thermometer 
that measures the power of the beam at particular locations. Again, the absorbing material on the thermometer is placed within the sound beam and the temperature is measured. So here is that absorbing material. This very tiny head of the thermometer is placed at different parts of the beam and based on the increase in heat in that area, we can extrapolate what the power is in that area as well. And lastly, we have liquid crystals. Now, liquid crystals are crystals that change color based on the temperature that is being applied to them. This can give us insight to the total power of the beam as energy changes to heat. And you've actually probably have seen this before with something called mood rings that change color based on the body heat of the person wearing the ring. So you may have noticed that as I was discussing these tools, that you can either measure the total power in the beam or measure at very specific locations. When we talked about measuring intensities, we learned that intensity changes based on the spatial considerations, either being in the very middle of the beam or towards the edge, which helped us define the average. We know that the middle of the beam is the most intense, where we have the least intensity at the edge. Now the tools that can measure specific locations in the beam help to calculate that spatial intensity. By observing the beam over time, then we know what the temporal considerations are, and those can be measured as well. So for bioeffects, we know that thermal bioeffects are related to the spatial peak temporal average intensity, or the SPTA. And we'll see that by measuring the pressure with the hydrophone, we can understand a little bit more about the mechanical bioeffects, but we also know that mechanical bioeffects are related to the spatial peak temporal peak, or the SPTP intensity. Section 24.3, Bioeffect Mechanisms. We know that ultrasound does have the capability of producing bioeffects. The two types of bioeffects that we know of are thermal, which is the heating of biological tissue, and mechanical, which affects little bubbles that can destroy biological tissue. Both of these mechanisms are monitored by the ultrasound system through the thermal and mechanical indices. These numbers can be found typically on the top of the screen. Thermal bioeffects result from the temperature in the tissues rising. Humans operate efficiently around 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If the temperature exceeds this level, certain cellular functions become impaired. And we know this from our body's instinct to run a fever to combat bacterial and viral infections that make us ill. Now remember that the body will attenuate the sound through absorption, scattering, and reflection. Since absorption is the biggest factor of attenuation and that energy is converted into heat, Thermal bioeffects are a real concern. We know that bone is a very strong absorber of sound, so tissue near bone is more likely to experience increased temperature. And we are particularly concerned about this with fetuses. Fetal tissue is more likely to experience temperature changes, therefore the thermal indices need to be carefully observed during fetal ultrasound. In this image here, we can see the femur of a fetus, it is the tissue around this femur, especially as this bone calcifies and hardens during gestation. The tissue around this is more likely to heat up because of this bone absorbing ultrasound energy. Heating will increase when the intensity or the frequency increases. However, because of attenuation, high frequencies don't cause significant changes, especially deep into the body. What the studies have shown us is that temperature increases of more than 2 degrees Celsius have been shown to cause cellular impairment. So up to a 2 degrees Celsius increase in temperature has no known bioeffects. But what some of the studies have shown us is that an increase of just 2 to 4 degrees Celsius in testicular temperature can result in infertility. And we also know that 4 degrees Celsius or more in fetuses is actually very potentially harmful. So it's the thermal index on the machine that tells us the possible temperature increase that can occur given the current machine settings. For example, if the thermal index is indicated to be 1.0, then there's potential for an increase of one degree during the exam. If the thermal index is at 2.0, the exam is at the maximum recommended thermal indice and the exposure time should be limited. Here I have a bunch of examples from different presets and different exams showing the thermal indices indicated by the machine. Starting up at the top here, we have a first trimester OB. The thermal indices are at 0.6. So this means that there is a possible 
increase of 0.6 degrees Celsius that could occur during this exam. We can see in the second trimester OB, because we are worried about the fetal bones which have hardened at this point, we want to make sure that thermal indice is even lower. So we're at 0.3 here. Taking a closer look at Pede's abdomen and general abdomen, we're looking at soft tissue thermal indices. We've got 0.1 and 0.2, very minimal. Looking at Pede's echo and adult echo, we see a 0.4 with Pede's echo and a 1.4 with adult echo. So we're actually potentially increasing temperature quite a bit with the adult echo settings. Jumping down to the last row here then, take a look at the thyroid thermal indice. It has it actually at zero. And this is because the thyroid is typically imaged with a very high frequency transducer. And that high frequency transducer is going to attenuate very quickly, mostly due to scattering and absorption. But there aren't really any bones in the neck that the ultrasound is interacting with, and so it's very unlikely that the soft tissue in the neck is going to increase in temperature. So it's a very, very safe exam for the soft tissue in the neck. On the carotid here, we have a 0.6 TI, uh, again, a very moderate amount, even with using the pulse wave Doppler. And then lastly, I know this is a little blurry, it's the best picture I can find, but we have a TIC, which is the thermal indice of the cranial bones at a 2.7. So this is actually exceeding the recommended limit for the thermal index, and we could potentially be causing some bioeffects of the brain tissue by prolonging this exam longer than necessary. We can see up to a 2.7 degrees Celsius change in the soft tissue that's near the cranial bones. So as we were looking at those numbers, you may have noticed the TIS, a TIB, and a TIC. Those are all referring to different ways to expressing the thermal index. So it's going to be more sensitive to changes that occur when the sound is interacting with different types of tissue. So TIS is the thermal index as the sound is interacting with soft tissue. So if you're doing a thyroid, an abdomen, a first trimester ultrasound, we're looking more at the TIS. TIB is when we are interacting sound with bony structures. And more often than not, you'll see the TIB being reported during fetal exams, again, because we're very concerned that as those fetal bones harden and calcify, they're going to absorb more sound, making the fetal tissue more susceptible to heating. TIC then refers to cranial bone thermal index, and this assumes that skull bones are in the very near field of the beam, which again are more likely to absorb the energy from the beam and heat up more. And as we saw in our image examples, the TIC during a transcranial Doppler had that TI value of 2.7, a very high thermal index. So let's go ahead and switch gears then to mechanical mechanisms. Mechanical mechanisms are also known as non-thermal mechanisms for producing bioeffects. Now the mechanical mechanism for bioeffects looks at the pressure changes of the ultrasound beam as it cycles through the tissue. Mechanical index, or MI, is calculated and informs the user of the likelihood that harmful bioeffects may occur due to something called cavitation. Cavitation, we'll learn in a minute, is how small gas bubbles that naturally occur in the body react to being in a sound beam. So recall that as the beam oscillates, there are moments of compressions when all the molecules are smushed together, and then there are moments of rarefaction when the molecules are spread apart. When the refraction portion of the beam interacts with a gas-filled bubble, the bubbles are going to expand. And under minimal pressure, the expansion is also minimal. But under great pressure, the bubble can expand so much that it ruptures. And the concern is, is that when the bubbles rupture, the energy released could damage cells around that gas bubble. There are naturally occurring gas bubbles all over the body. However, we find that they are more heavily concentrated in the lungs and in the intestines. So mechanical index is based on the peak rarefractional pressure and frequency. And we'll see that the likelihood of cavitation to occur is going to increase as we lower the frequency. So from our formula here, which might be our last formula of our physics adventure, is the mechanical indice it is equal to the peak rarefraction pressure divided by the square root of the transducer frequency. So we can see that peak rarefraction pressure is directly related to 
the mechanical index, so if there's more pressure, it's going to cause a higher mechanical index. We also see then that frequency is inversely related to the mechanical index, so if we lower our transducer frequency, we'll see an increase in the mechanical index value. Again, lower frequencies are going to make it more likely that cavitation will occur. So let's take a closer look at what cavitation is. There are two forms of cavitation that we need to know about, stable and transient. The biggest thing to know about stable cavitation is that the bubbles do not burst. They're going to shrink and expand during the compressions and refractions as they interact with the sound beam. Stable cavitation occurs typically at lower mechanical indice levels. So the bubbles are going to absorb the energy and expand and contract, but during the expansion and contraction, they do create kind of their own pressure waves which then causes the surrounding cells to undergo microstreaming, which can cause shear stresses. While unlikely, the shear stresses can cause damage to the cells. So in our example here, we can see a bubble that is oscillating. It is not bursting. This is stable cavitation. It is increasing and decreasing in size. It's not going to rupture. But we need to make the leap that this bubble making this motion in the body is going to create small pressure waves exuding from it. And we actually can see that in this picture here. This is a very, very close up picture of a bubble that is oscillating. And now we can see the micro streaming and the shear stresses that are being produced by this bubble oscillating. It sends energy in other directions. So we are concerned that the cells that would interact with these microstreamings or with these shear stresses would react negatively and possibly become damaged. The energy that is released by a bubble undergoing stable cavitation is much lower than a bubble that experiences transient cavitation. Now in transient cavitation, it's important to know that this is where the bubble bursts. We expect to see an implosion of the bubble and when doing so, the risk for bioeffects increases greatly. So transient cavitation is also known as inertial cavitation or normal cavitation. Those are synonyms for transient cavitation. And they are going to occur when we see higher mechanical indice levels. Typically what happens is that the high ultrasound energy is going to cause the small gas bubbles to burst, and when the bubbles rupture, they can cause damage to a few cells in the immediate area. Now, it doesn't take much to transition from stable cavitation to transient cavitation. In fact, it really only needs a beam that's about 10% stronger than what created the stable cavitation. So it is very easy to use too much ultrasound power, risking transient cavitation. So when those bubbles burst, they cause not only kind of a shock wave to occur, but they also cause a huge temperature increase. We're talking like in the thousands for a brief, brief moment in time. And again, this destruction is very localized. It's only detrimental to the very few immediately adjacent cells. But if you're only a few cells to begin with, like an embryo, we don't want to risk destroying those cells. So in this example here, again, we can see the bubble rupturing and we can see the energy that is coming off of it through the shock wave. When this occurs, it creates an intense amount of temperature. You can actually see a little flash right in the middle. That's that very, very hot spot. And then the shock wave expands out from that bubble as well. So as that energy interacts with the cells around it, that could be enough energy to damage or even destroy cells that are immediately adjacent or localized to the cavitating bubbles. Now you may recall that we have talked about mechanical indices prior and talked about bubbles along with it. So the mechanical index principles do apply both to contrast agents and to those naturally occurring gas bubbles in the body. However, contrast agents are meant to withstand the ultrasound pressure where the natural bubbles are more likely to be affected by ultrasound. The mechanical index is also indicated at the top of the image. The MI value refers to the megapascals of pressure in the wave. So MIs less than 1.9 are considered generally safe for humans. So looking at this image here, we can see that all of these are well below the 1.9 threshold. However, through some tests from the AIUM, they did recognize that in testing mice, 
an MI of 0.4 was enough to cause lung hemorrhages, and an MI of 1.4 caused hemorrhage in the intestines. So this again reminds us that ultrasound bioeffects are real, very unlikely if we use our ultrasound machines correctly, but it just further highlights that it is very crucial to be prudent with the use of ultrasound. Section 24.4, clinical discussion. Let's go ahead and finish up this unit with a very brief clinical discussion about bioeffects. So as a sonographer, you will get asked very often, is the ultrasound safe? Or what happens often is that a patient might mistakenly refer to the radiation that they're receiving from their ultrasound procedures. By being up to date on safety statements from our professional organizations, we can help to reassure them that ultrasound is a safe and inexpensive imaging procedure with countless benefits to the medical field. Now really nothing in medicine is without absolute risk, but when tests and medications are ordered, the ordering provider has evaluated the risks and benefits, and it is clear that when the benefits outweigh the risks, the correct course of action is being taken. So as sonographers, we really need to be cognizant of our role in patient care and the scope of our practice. We need to make sure that we only perform exams when ordered by a licensed professional, use our machines in accordance with best practices, and minimize patient risk by applying ALARA to every exam. And that is the end of our Unit 24, Patient Safety and Bioeffects. There's a lot of definitions in this unit. Focus on those first and then understand what the tools are to measure the bioeffects and then really understand how thermal mechanisms are created via absorption and it causes the tissue to heat up. We're looking to keep it under two degrees Celsius where mechanical mechanisms are based on the pressure in the wave causing bubbles to undergo cavitation, which might possibly rupture, taking cells along with them. As usual, I have included a few activities in your workbook that you can work through to help understand the concepts, and then you have your nerd check questions, which are open-ended questions in which you can test your knowledge of the content presented.